Ready, set, crank. You ready? Yeah. It's been a while since we last saw the Golden Era 190E, yet the work hasn't slowed down. Day by day, part by part, Nate and the team have chipped away at the extensive process of cherry picking parts from the FCPO shelves to make them work as if it were the Mercedes engineers themselves putting it together. With a substantial amount of work still to do, it was all hands on deck to get the car finished and ready to drive. Arguably one of the most stressful tasks was fitting the new starter. This engine and transmission, even though the bell housing is bolt up, there is not a place for the starter to actually live. So what we're going to be doing is we're using a W204 uh, C300 starter. Okay, what we need to do is this flange here, I think will be about this flange right here. We might have to put a spacer or two on the back and then on the bottom there's actually no flange so we're going to have to have a full spacer. See that ring right there? That's what tells the engine management where the position of the engine. So this is a crank position sensor, this is the crank position ring and obviously this comes through here and out this side. Starter's gonna be right there, so we gotta be really sensitive to what we're doing with this wire and this sensor. Um, this is 100% critical for the engine to run properly, so we really need to make sure we keep it safe and don't, don't damage it in the process. Definitely gonna make changing the crank position sensor a little more difficult. <laughs> the extra step of removing the starter motor every time you need to do that. Leave it something like this. So we know that hole but obviously everything below that is gonna to need to be cut out. What I'm gonna do here is take this front flange and I'm gonna make a cardboard template of it so I can hold it over here and see exactly what it looks like. All right, she's gonna be close, but we should have enough room. Nate had to precisely measure and cut into the engine block to position the starter perfectly to engage with the flywheel. Any mistake there meant the 190E would need an entirely new block. How are you feeling? Nervous? Confident? Um... Confidently nervous? Oh. Yeah, confidently nervous. Or nervously confident. I think that's the better one. We did everything we can. We have this plate here. That's going to hold the drill in place. So, uh, you know, I think we've done everything we can do to be uh, safe and, you know, all the precautions have been taken. So let's slowly kind of bore in here, see what happens, and we'll go from there. There you go. There's the, the beginning of a hole for a starter. Something like that. You might have to do a little more notching down here in the bottom, but you can see we are starting to make progress. Nice. It's the beginning. Ensuring the starter was mocked up and aligned correctly was a huge step, but there was more to do before it could be mounted for the final time. The M133 still needed some refreshing, so Scheffler sent over technical specialist Jason Haney who brought some Scheffler, Ina, and Luke parts that were needed to help finish the car. He even lent a hand and provided some insight into the history about Scheffler's engineering and manufacturing. So FAG or Scheffler bearings was started in the late 1880s by Frederick Fisher. So that's really about basically when Mercedes was building the first car. That was a little bit before Daimler actually got his first car on the road. Okay. So most likely, I don't have any proof of it, probably FAG bearings in the wheels in that three-wheeler. So FAG is the oldest of our brands, which is now branded Scheffler. But Scheffler Brothers started ENA in the 50s. And basically they made bearings and components for engines. That's what they got, got into, even though they didn't have a technical background. And so that's where this company has grown. Uh, the acquisition of Luke, Luke was started in the 60s as a diaphragm spring clutch manufacturer. They wanted to get away from the lever style. They moved on there and they were acquired in the 90s. So now everything's basically under the brand Scheffler. Every car in the world that rolls off an assembly line has something from Scheffler in it. Every brand new car does. Wow, that's pretty incredible. Nate and Jason made quick work of refreshing the M133's ancillary engine accessories. 
properly functioning parts are critical to any engine, and installing the fresh plugs, coils, and accessory belt ensured the AMG engine was set up for a successful first attempt at its new life. If you recall, the M274's oil pan was exactly what the team needed, but not without some additional modifications still needing to be done. With the help of local fabricator and FCP Euro customer John Volk, a new oil pickup was fashioned to pull oil from the sump's deepest area. As a race car, managing G-forces is also a concern, so a custom baffle plate was fitted for safety. After that, fabrication was complete and the oil pan was bolted onto the engine for the final time. So we're all set here. Um, we've sealed it up, bolted it down, gone through, kind of sorted out some of the oiling system for the turbo, made sure all this stuff was, was ready to be buttoned up. Up front, we have a E46 AC belt on here. Um, it actually works perfectly for our shortened length. So we should be good, and now we're gonna flip the engine over. Um, we're gonna pick it up off of this stand, and we're gonna start putting the flywheel and clutch and transmission on it. Not only are we really excited about bringing the build series back and getting this car finished up, but we're also really excited about these awesome limited edition Golden Era t-shirts. Scan the QR code over here to get yours. And remember, head over to svero.com for all your European car needs. Now, back to wrenching on this thing. The drivetrain was in need of the most attention. The custom clutch and flywheel were next for a final install. It's rev time. Let's go mate this thing up and hopefully get these splines lined up. Can I grab someone to back this engine up? Ugh. Ugh. This is a pain. closer than it's ever been there. Is it moving at all? Hey. Oh, I love this thing. Ah. Get some wood. Ah. <laughs> Finally, it was time to lubricate the engine. Taking a page from our IMSA GT4 team, Liquimali's Lakloff 5W40 was the oil of choice for the engine, while the turbocharger received some Proline turbo additive to keep all the bearings lubricated during initial startup. Next thing we'll do is we'll pull the spark plugs out, we'll crank the engine over a couple times by hand to make sure we prime the oil pump, all that sort of stuff. Once we do that, we will then put some electricity to the starter motor, make sure that the uh, gear comes out, engages the flywheel, spins the flywheel properly, and then disengages. So I'm looking through the hole where the PCV port is on the side of the block, um, which is actually kind of right in the part where the cylinder head will drain down to the block or down to the oil pan. And I can actually see it's all wet with oil, which shows that the, the engine is cycling oil up to the top, to the camshaft, and then it's dripping back down to the sump. It's just this line is pretty long, so we're kind of waiting for oil pressure to push all the way through that line. So then it can go through the turbo and we can make sure we're cycling oil through all the critical bits of the engine. Just wait till this thing finally actually fires up. Works. That's gonna be, that's it gonna be works. like full on back to the future. The drivetrain may have been ready for installation, but there was still buttoning up to do elsewhere. Fuel lines had to be run up to the new fuel pressure regulator, and there was still some chassis wiring to take care of. Luckily, FCP Euro's wiring specialist, Karim, drove down from Canada just for the occasion. Hey guys. Welcome back. Thank you very much. So from here on, we can start laying the wires down, securing them, doing the sheathing on them, putting the power distribution panel, getting the electricity all the way through the engine and the front lights, and we can make a race car for real this time. So I have to put a battery isolator in, so we're gonna go do that. The battery isolator, which will basically isolate the battery from the rest of the electrical circuit. So if we need to shut something down in emergency, we can just hit the button and kill everything properly. It basically kills off the system without damaging any parts of the electronic in the car. You drilled and tap already? Yep, it's already drilled and tapped. Not bad for a noob. 
Since Karim was last in the shop, significant progress had been made on the mechanical side of the project, which meant a lot of it was now ready for wiring. Putting his previous plan into action, he laid the wiring out for the fueling system, PDM, and the rest of the components on the chassis side to get a sense of where it all needed to go. So basically, uh, what we've used uh, for this car, instead of using multiple switches and relays, we're using a power distribution panel, which basically uh, is a combination of the panel switches and the relays built into the same unit, as you can see here. It's fairly thin for all the functions that it does. It has 16 different channels, individual, or you can be combining them for higher amperage, up to 30 amps per channel, which is pretty cool. And we outfit every buttons with their functions, and you can use basically whichever function was assigned to it with its own sticker, so that everything keeps in order. While figuring out which wires needed to go where, templates were drawn up for the dashboard faceplate and the PDM's mount. Nate then brought them down to Sports Car Restoration in Plainville, Connecticut. We got the CarTech PDM, just so you guys can use it for measuring. Dash panel. This will fold up over the transmission tunnel, kind of guard some of the shifter stuff. And then this will sit on top and mount the PDM. The steady hands there took those templates and bent them into shape from aluminum before spraying them in a durable undercoating finish. Yet, in between all of the major work, it was the arrival of some smaller components that got Nate really excited. We got the seats. It's really light. I feel like I'm trying on clothes here. It's totally boring up front, and then when you look at the back, that's when it gets cool. As Ben says, it's the mullet of seats. Business up front, party out back. Nothing but the best of the 80s right here. Carbon Kevlar, no logos here. Per golden era regulations, we wanted to keep it old school and simple. <laughs> With the entire to-do list checked off, the engine and gearbox were fitted into the chassis for the final time. We just got the wiring harness back from the assembly line. Took a bit of time. These guys are good. Assembling most of the car without the aggressive thrum of the M133 had been a challenge, but at last, the pivotal piece that had held up the build for months had arrived. It was finally time to install the engine harness and fire up the heart of the Golden Era project. Apparently these things were absolutely impossible to get, which was basically the interface between both harnesses on the bulkhead. And they've made a proper document, so we have all the pinouts and everything. First up is gonna be inserting the harness, connecting everything together in the different positions, assembling everything, connecting wire by wire, or should I say connector by connector now. Uh, powering up this thing, checking the connections to every single sensor, checking that we can talk to the coils, to the injectors, test firing them, cranking it over to read the, the position sensors, and then hopefully firing it today and doing donuts tomorrow morning. This is where the nuanced mastery of engine wiring and planning comes together. The satisfying click of fresh connectors was everything the team had waited for. Their hard work was finally going to pay off with a bespoke, well-organized, and labeled wiring harness. Not all was perfect though. The starter's location made its wiring connection tight at best, so the team had to get creative. So we had to gut the connector, which was preventing the starter to be put in place, and we basically potted the wires and the terminals directly inside the, basically a motorsport job, motorsport hack job. It has to be done. How you know many clips I have of you doing this in the last two days? Shut up. <laughs> Simulating um, something moving next to the sensor. Okay, try it now. Yeah. I see signals. Yeah, it's it's decreasing actually. It's a going down. I've always said the, the crank position sensor, when you go in on this, okay. it comes in on a weird 45 degree angle. And in, you know, like if you have a sheet metal rear main seal plate, there's a little cut for it, and the crank position sensor has to go in the cut and like grab it. And it's really like tricky to get in there. Is if this is where it's supposed to be, it was like sitting like, it was just off the side. So it wasn't getting a signal. So. Never the tuner's fault, never. <laughs> All right, we're online. Start turning. Yes, I have sensors. Nate, you probably should have put that in yourself. <laughs> that has blamed on me somehow. 
After the starter was taken care of, Karim began his wiring system checks, plugging into the ECU and manually checking each sensor, pump, and meter. It is a time-consuming process, but essential for such a completely custom project. One wire out of place could throw everything off and send the team down a diagnostic rabbit hole. Well, that one has the lock broken. Yeah. So the pins are loose. Yeah. This is how you fix Mercedes problems. A pin. Ready? Your pick. And pinch. He did it. I'm looking for all the sensors to be able to position the engine properly for the ECU so that it finds its own logic level and this starts. That's basically what I'm trying to do. So we're looking at the crank sensor, the cam sensors, intake and exhaust, all the throttle position sensors, the throttle pedal sensors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to make it make sense, basically. And then, then we're gonna to try to start the engine. I'm just trying to make sure it's not leaking anything. I'm still at 3.9 volts, which should theoretically be the pull-up resistor inside the system. So it's like something's not closing the buckle because I should be hovering at zero volts when it's plugged in. So what we're gonna try to do, we're gonna remove the DTM plug and we're gonna try to jump some wires. We're gonna try to find first which is the eight volt or the five volt and try to jump the other wires. You ready? Yeah. Stop. Great success. So what, we're good now? Yeah, we're good now. We're gonna start the car. We're gonna do the fuel systems check, make sure the pumps run on, nothing leaks, and then we plug everything back in and start the car. Feel good vibrations. Fuel, plenty of it. Regulated fuel. Regulated? Put your thumb on it, see if we get the foil. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, don't do that. <laughs> Ready, boys? Go. Bye. You're gonna hit the star button and I'm gonna tell you, Nate. Okay. Just wanna make sure we got our PM. Go ahead. With the minor wiring hiccups out of the way, everything was seemingly lined up as needed. Unfortunately, the throttle body didn't agree. Without it properly actuating, one of the parameters needed to fire up the engine was nowhere to be found. We're viewing the throttle body. Why? Because we're struggling with calibration on it. There's something wrong with the sensor, I think. We're, right now we're looking, there's a little bit of a wiring discrepancy between the number four injector, the throttle body, and the ECU. Um, we're not sure if somewhere in there um, a pin or a wire got crossed up, possibly. Um, but we've been going through it and trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, just trying to diagnose it so we can have a throttle body that doesn't freak itself out. And I got a variation, but it's literally 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 0 0.05, 0 0.04 volts. Let me try it one last time. Hold on. You ready? Yeah. Opening. No difference. Fuck all. Yep, yep, yep. I got gotcha. A considerably productive day buttoning up nearly every system in the car was abruptly ended by a faulty throttle body. That meant just one final hurdle to overcome after ordering some overnight parts from Germany. So through rewiring this and diagnosing it, we basically determined that the throttle body is no good. And that is the weak link. But unfortunately we don't have a throttle body to throw at it right now. So we know what to do. We know where we're at. We'll fix it. So last time we were here, we needed a new throttle body. Uh, we installed a new throttle body. Now Krim and, and Corey are working through this. So we're dialing in fuel pressure, um, and then we're gonna try to crank this thing over and get this thing to fire up. Yeah, I can definitely hear him. Stop. 
Okay, that is Z. Okay, that is uppercase M. So we found one mispinned connector already. So basically the connector was supposed to go to pin Y, went to pin X. Um, and if there's more of those, then what we're doing is we're sending inputs through here that are not communicating with the things they need to communicate with. So we double checked some of the wiring. Um, we figured out where the signal wires for high, or the control wires for the high pressure fuel pump control were going. And then Crims made some changes on the software side to update that to make sure it is communicating the way it needs to and that we have control over the high pressure fuel pump, which seems to be the issue because we're firing injectors, but we're not getting a lot of fuel into the engine. So basically the injectors are opening, but there's no, not enough pressure behind them for the fuel to squirt into the cylinders. We got sputters. Ready? Got a good feeling about this one as uh, I get excited when Krim gets excited. Krim, you excited? Corey excited? I'm excited? I want to hear this thing run. Corey's tired. Oh my god, everybody's there. No pressure, guys, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, Here's one hold. extra voice. All right, try that. So we just fired the engine up, uh, ran it for about 30 seconds, which is about as long as we want to without any cooling in this, coolant in this car. Um, we're going to put the expansion tank on, we're going to get all of the cooling pipes plumbed in, um, and then we're going to tidy up some of this wiring a little bit, and we're gonna get over to the dyno and tune this engine and see what kind of power it can put out. A little bit of an overrun, <laughs> slightly. Now this thing's gonna be a beast. With the car finally running and only a short list of things left to do, will the 190E survive its first date with the dyno or will the team be left with new problems to solve? Follow along on the next episode of The Golden Era.